Okay, everybody, if we can, if we can recommence, and can I say that this conference has really started on an exceptionally high and moving note, and I, I like you, I am totally in awe of Philomena and the way she tells her story. We now need to move the discussion along and I think Philomena will probably join us with her daughter. But we have a number of speakers now who are going to broaden the discussion and we're going to start with an input from the two conference organizers who have brought this wonderful event together, Dr. Ashley Parks and Dr. Simone Cochran. And they're going to start off uh, by giving us a uh, short presentation. <coughs> then uh, we have a panel uh, composed of Trina Hall, uh, a team leader from Adoption Services with the HSC in Cork who's going to be talking about bridging the old with the new, current challenges and dilemmas for social work practitioners in adoption. And then Christy Kerwin is going to give us the optic, the experience of an opti from Vespera Mother and Baby Home here in Cork. And he's going to be followed by uh, Rhoda McManus uh, from the group Adoption Loss and uh, that is going to be our panel. Now they're all going to speak uh, for about 10 minutes uh, each and when they've all spoken we'll have questions and answers. Okay? So if we could start with Ashling and Simone. Thank you, Professor Paul. Um, so this morning, Simone and I are going to speak to you about adoption in a digital age, social media, children's rights and appropriate responses. And I suppose within that context, we are, I suppose, delivering what is a dis an interdisciplinary paper in the sense that I will discuss how the law operates, or, you know, I suppose, in, in a sense, what is the existing law in the area of adoption how that law has been challenged over the various developments that have emerged in recent years and, and over the last couple of decades. And then Simone will move on and talk about how practice has operated within the parameters of the law in an attempt, though, to move forward. So we thought it would be particularly useful to um, start with this quote, which I suppose in a sense um, represents the complexity and the emotion that attaches to the subject area of adoption. So it is by a lady called Kathleen Callanan from 2002, a piece of research that she carried out, um, she's from St. Anne's Society, uh, Adoption Society in Cork, and I suppose the quote is particularly relevant for the information, um, and it, the information that we talk about today because it highlights qualitative experience and issues of concern from all angles. So she suggests that evidence that su suggests that these searches have had mixed outcomes. Some mothers are angry that they have been contacted on behalf of the adoption person, having understood that no contact would be made after their child was given up. A mixture of relief, sadness and hope overwhelms them, others. And yet others are simply unable to face the pain of reopening old wounds. For many, the birth of their child is a secret they never shared. There is great frustration that information, by, or which by today's standards they might expect to be made readily available, is withheld from them. However, such information is withheld because of the honouring of confidentiality given to the mother at the time of the birth. These adopted people have grown up with an understanding of children's rights, which was only beginning to be acknowledged at the time of their birth to be denied, therefore. Such basic information as their original name, 
unless the consent of their natural mother can be secured, to reveal it, it is often seen as an affront to their dignity as adults and their rights as citizens. So what is the current adoption law context? And the question that we raise is whether or not it's fit for, for, for purpose. I suppose the answer to that we're all quite aware of, but nonetheless I think it is important to identify really what the law says. So we're all quite clear that today the 1952 Act, which was the principal act for so long until 2010, is still um, the act that, has, that is framed in the Adoption Act 2010. So it still represents the closed model of adoption, or which some people would like to refer to as a transplant model of adoption, which I think is more aggressive. But essentially, I think Baroness Hale sets out what this actually means in practice and from a legal perspective, which is that an adoption order severs irrevocably and for all time the legal relationship between a child and her family of birth. It creates irrevocably and for all time, unless the child is later adopted into another family, a new legal relationship, not only between the child and her adoptive parents, but between the child and each of their adoptive parents' families. We now know, and it, it, I suppose it, it's been discussed and will be discussed at great length throughout the course of the next few days, that in Ireland today there is no legal right for adoptees to information and tracing services. And I suppose while there is discussion at the moment concerning the new information and tracing bill, um, I suppose the question is will it go far enough? And we haven't, Simone will, will discuss a little bit later on, but we haven't got any concrete information as to what is exactly included in that bill. However, what we do have is the IOT and B judgment, which we have heard referenced earlier on this morning, which essentially, while not an adoption case, because in this situation, um, the two adoptees or the two ladies who were looking for um, the identity of their birth mothers or their, the mothers who um, had, had their children placed with parents. Essentially, they, the, the adoption law had not yet been put into place. So these happened before the 1952 Act and so they were not legal adoptions as such. However, why is the case significant and why does it continue to be discussed given that it isn't an adoption case per se? The reason why is because within that case there was concrete discussion about what constitutional rights a natural um, mother has or a mother who has her child placed with another family and what are the rights <coughs> of the child who is placed. And in this context, the Supreme Court was of the opinion that the child unquestionably has an unenumerated right to identity, an unenumerated constitutional right to identity. However, that right is not absolute, despite the fact that the Supreme Court acknowledged that it is a basic right flowing from the natural relationship between mother and child. The Court further went on to acknowledge that children do enjoy the constitutional right to know the identity of their natural mother, but the exercise of that right must be restricted by the constitutional rights of the natural mother. And what's also interesting is that the Supreme Court acknowledged that the natural mother's rights are also not absolute to privacy. So I suppose that is really what the critical question is. How do we figure out how to balance those rights and who makes that decision? In the Supreme Court judgment, a number of factors were set out by the court um, I suppose, which would help in deciding how to balance those rights. Secrecy that surrounded, surrounds this closed model of adoption is really reflective of the focus of the time of the 1952 Act and the culture within which it was drafted. In recent times, there have been challenges, serious challenges, to the legal framework. And in particular, we're going to focus on two of those today. The first being the recognition and importance that attaches to children's rights. Because essentially, children's rights have served 
to influence law, policy and practice in Ireland. There's also, I suppose, the development over recent decades of the World Wide Web and access to the internet and the new world of cyberspace and the availability of information. So to talk a little bit about international children's rights law, I suppose, generally speaking, children's rights began to emerge in the early 90s with the um, adoption of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what's interesting about that international document is that it's the first document that specifically identifies a right to identity. And the right to identity, while not expressly set out in detail in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, has been interpreted to include the right to know your origins, where you come from, where you were born, all of that information that you need to know when you grow up and throughout your, your adult life. International human rights and children's rights is really about redistributing redistrib unequal power. And the question that we really need to think about is the obvious question, which we all know the answer to, have there been imbalances in that power in the past? Rights-based analysis of adoption reminds us that the interests of one party cannot be promoted or prioritised to the exclusion of another's rights. Decision makers must focus on the child as an autonomous individual with separate and competing rights and interests to which the state must have regard. So with this growing awareness in legal and social work networks nationally, context, um, nationally and internationally, new challenges have been raised um, in the context of adoption in particular. So as I've already mentioned, the UN Convention acknowledges the right to identity of a child. That's also recognised under the European Convention on Human Rights under Article 8, which protects the right to private and family life, which includes the right to identity. There's also the right to freedom of expression. Freedom of expression isn't just the freedom to express your views, but it's also the, um, I suppose it encapsulates the right to receive the views of others through information. And so I suppose this links in with the internet and what we discuss later and the availability of that information the fact that children and adults have the ability to navigate the internet and have the freedom to define that information. The Convention also protects children from, the right, or from, from harm under Article 19. And essentially what that means is that any legislation that the, the state um, designs ult ultimately in, in respect of information and tracing and in any other area of adoption must be sure to protect children from harm. And so if children are, do become aware through, for example, other forms of um, open adoption and, and different av avenues of information, it's really important that they are protected in the process. So I think this um, definition from Professor Michael Freeman of identity really sets out Article 7 and 8 in a nutshell. It's what we know and what we feel. It's an organising framework for holding together our past and our present, and it provides some anticipated shape to future life. Protection from harm and freedom of expression which come later are very much inextricably linked. The state has an obligation, as I say, to protect children from harm and the state will have an obligation to ensure that children are protected while they're accessing the internet. As I said before, in recent decades the internet has become the new form of networking and communication amongst children. That is their social life nowadays, social media, Facebook, Twitter, and the accessibility of, the, of information to them is something that is a reality. It's not going away. And by bringing in legislation that doesn't give any sort of reference to that is denying the future reality. And so it is very important that if there, when the, the information and tracing bill does come in, that in some way it reflects that reality that it acknowledges the fact that children will go on the internet if they have information about their parents or their siblings or others. And so what protections is the state going to put in place to protect children in the process? The right to freedom of expression, as I say, it's not just about, I suppose, the social media, but it's also about the online searching. It's really important that this is a reality now. This is what happens. It's really important that the law catches up with reality. As you can see, 
Article 13, in terms of freedom of expression, specifically sets out, and this is in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the, the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Why do I have that there? I have it there because there's no age limit set down there. So, if we're talking about the right to information, at what age are we going to say that children should have access to information about themselves going forward? Are we going to follow England and Wales? Are we going to follow Scotland where the age is 17, England it's 18? Or are we going to say children should have that information from when they're capable of understanding it? So, in a nutshell, that's really about the challenges. That's about, you know, children's rights are very much a reality of everyday life. It's something that's accepted in society now, both within law and in practice. And social media, navigating the internet and the world wide, world wide web are very much part of everyday reality. The law needs to catch up. Has the law responded to these changes? I think the answer to that is quite simple, no. I will now pass over to my colleague, Dr. McCochran, to talk you through the other side of the story. So I'm just going to follow on from uh, what Ashley said, and I want to make links with what she has said, because social work practice has developed within the parameters of the law. Um, which has meant that practi the practice response is not always that adequate. We would say it is an inadequate response. Um, and I think it's particularly um, challenging for um, the social work profession who obviously have undergone a significant um, amount of uh, reputational damage and particularly challenging for a new generation of social workers who come from an educational system that espouses values of equality, rights and social justice. And the balance, the balance that we're talking about is the balance that must be struck between the rights of both the adopted child, now adult, and mothers whose children were placed for adoption. Um, so practitioners, I suppose we just want to explain a little bit about this balance and what it is we're, we're, we're talking about. Practitioners are, are meeting and working with um, some mothers who believe that they were given a guarantee of confidentiality and that the state has a, has a responsibility and an obligation uh, to, to fulfil that promise. There are then um, some mothers who believe that their children were forcibly placed for adoption um, and that they did not give full, free and informed consent. And I suppose we are balancing um, this with a new generation of uh, natural mothers who nowadays have more choice um, in the adoption process, more input and more control in the, in the system, but whereby um, the practice of open adoption um, is a practice that is absolutely not supported by the law. Um, it's an agreement um, to, to maintain contact with um, the adoptive family and the child, but that is not supported by law, it is a goodwill agreement. There are also mixed perspectives as well from those children, now adults, uh, who, who choose either to um, maybe access information, some who choose to search, um, and some who, who choose none of the above. Um, and then again, we are balancing this then with uh, contemporary practice, open adoption, which is some acknowledgement um, of children's rights that takes into account uh, contact between all parties. And it is encouraged, again, if, if it is in the best interest of the child. So I think, hopefully, that summarises the various perspectives involved in the information tracing process, highlighting the different interpretations um, of rights and needs by the different parties. And now, I suppose, I just want to move on to look at, I suppose, the traditional approaches. How do people um, who are wanting to find out more information and search for either their natural mother or other way around um, um, approach um, the system. And I suppose the traditional approach has been that um, an adoptive person would approach an accredited body from where they were placed um, or put that formal request in writing to the Adoption Authority of Ireland. And as we have clearly said before, there is no right to even non-identifying information and there certainly is no right um, in law to identifying information. And when we mean non-identifying information, the type of information um, that has been given um, to adopted people can be very basic information because um, it's quite <coughs> often the situation that um, um, inaccurate um, files um, were kept or inaccurate record keeping. Um, so what an adopted person might come out with is very little. Um, 
Then what adoptive people are facing nowadays, if they do make the decision to trace, they're facing long waiting lists up to two years. And I know my colleague Trina is going to talk about, I suppose, the significant increase in files that they have uh, received into their agency and yet very little support and resources to, to, back, to back that up. Um, if a person does uh, pursue um, um, a, a trace, uh, so there will be allocated a trained social worker uh, who will be there to support, mediate and facilitate the process. I suppose we are now, um, I suppose, encountering um, a situation where we are seeing very different responses from adoptees, and the internet and social media has a huge has had a huge influence over the whole information tracing and searching process uh, as we know it. Um, people are circumventing the traditional approaches to gathering information, um, and are either going down the route of uh, getting their own private investigators. Um, some are getting information from agencies. Um, and getting enough information to put the pieces of the jigsaw together, which will enable them to go to Joyce House, which is the civil registration um, service for, for births, um, and sometimes putting two and two together um, and coming up with the right answer, but not always. Um, and I'm going to um, quote a little bit from a colleague of mine, uh, Judy McGrath, um, who did um, a, a study into this area, and her study reported that in social worker mediated reunions, Letter writing was promoted as the initial method of contact. Participants in her study had very mixed feelings towards letter writing because some valued its slow and methodical nature, others expressed a preference for contact by email or text. And there were a number of explanations as to why that was preferable, as was both a faster and an everyday form of regular communication, while letter writing was associated with formality and delayed responses. And similarly, tracing relatives through the internet can be done with speed, with which people can now routinely access many other kinds of information um, and with their level of comfort and famili familiarity with the internet. But I suppose there is um, um, I suppose a caveat here in that for young people um, accustomed to using the internet, um, what McGrath found is that um, participants' initial re reasons for searching um, um, often led them to much more detailed and emotional experiences than they had originally anticipated and as the search process progressed they found that they had more and deeper questions than originally expected um, and there are other, uh, I suppose several other groups, Adoption Rights Alliance being one of them, that do provide uh, many I suppose, online support um, services for adopted people but I suppose that what um, practitioners are often finding is that people are encountering um, sometimes um, situations that they haven't um, fully um, um, anticipated. So I am very uh, briefly, I suppose, going to um, just um, move on to the internet and open adoption. Um, and Deputy Ferris um, mentioned the open adoption bill. Um, the internet has to be something that we consider in open adoption practice. Um, as I said, open adoption practice is operating without um, any legal safeguards um, to, I suppose, um, ensure that the parameters are, are safely um, there in, in open adoptions. And um, you've got to remember that in open adoptions, children already have a level of information. So they may be in um, contact with their natural families, their natural mother, and they may have uh, regular meetings and photographs. And I think what, as a nation, we're not prepared for is what the UK have experienced, and Eileen Fursand has um, um, undertaken a number of, uh, <coughs> quite a bit of research in this area, is that the internet can pose uh, quite a significant um, amount of harm and threat um, to adopted people, and in, in terms of them, I suppose, accessing information and coming across information uh, that um, they're not being supported uh, to find. Um, so what we are saying um, here today really I suppose in terms of looking at um, inadequate responses in terms of both the law and the social work practice, there is no right to not identifying information in law. There is no right to identifying information in law. Uh, there is yet no adequately resourced professional support service for adopted people or for natural mothers. And what I think um, has come out from even the, the short kind of discussion this, mor this morning is that what adopted people are often coming across is inconsistent responses from accredited bodies, which is not good enough. 
So moving forward, what are the most appropriate responses? Um, Deputy Ferris mentioned the Open mm -hmm. Adoption uh, Bill 2014. Um, we believe that legal recognition of open adoption is one way of ensuring that where an adoption take, takes place, that the best interests and rights of the child are central to this process. Information and tracing bill, I suppose now is an opportune time to reflect on adoption law reform for the future. To date, this is the only information we have on the information and tracing bill from uh, former Minister uh, Fitzgerald, who said that structured and regulated, it's going to be a structured, regulated approach for applicants seeking access to adoption information to facilitate contact between parties affected by adoption, including where an adoption order has not been made. I suppose our big question today is, is this going to go far enough? We don't believe that placing the National Contact Prefer Preference Register on a statutory footing is enough. Moving forward, uh, we believe that uh, law and practice needs to operate uh, more uh, cohesively um, and that the bill, I suppose, should take into consideration um, uh, issues that we have discussed today, I suppose, the relevance and concern now of children's rights and social media and access um, of information. We believe that the right to identity going forward, that it should be a statutory right to identifying information and open adoption practice. And we believe that um, there's a huge, I suppose, injection of resources required in order to make any of this happen. Uh, we, we need to make information more widely available. And um, Philomena did speak about not knowing where to go. Some natural mothers do not know where to go. And as has been said in the audience, some natural mothers do not want to go back to the agencies um, from where their children were placed. So we need to look at resources in a very serious way. And I think as well what uh, would be a positive outcome of this conference and a positive um, suggestion to make is that services um, should really in this day and age be in a position to work in a more collaborative way uh, with uh, some of the voluntary organisations. I think that would be a very positive um, step forward. Thank you.